Hey, hey, this is Julian and you are on Eat the Blocks. In this video, I'm going to give you a list of 15 gotchas for solidity. These gotcha are real little things that can really surprise you, especially when you already have a background from another programming language like JavaScript or Python. So instead of wasting time and try to figure out everything by yourself, do yourself a favor, watch this video. By the way, if at any time you're a bit lost when I mention a solidity gotcha, then you can check out my series on solidity where I dive into every aspect of the language. This is very, very comprehensive. So the first gotcha is that Solidity changed a lot between Solidity 0.4 and Solidity 0.5. So you'll find a lot of outdated tutorial for the old version of Solidity. So be careful when you read online tutorial. Make sure that these are for Solidity 0.5. The second gotcha is that in Solidity, private variables are not so private. So when you define a private variable, actually it's only private for other smart contract. That means the other smart contract will not be able to read the value of this variable. But if you are outside the blockchain, you will still see this variable inside the blockchain because the Ethereum blockchain is a public blockchain. So anything that is in the blockchain is absolutely publicly accessible. So granted, it will not be super easy for someone to read this variable because you will need to use some blockchain anal analysis tool, but it's totally doable. The next gotcha is about strings. So in Solidity, we do have a string type, but it's actually not so easy to manipulate. And especially if you use to language like JavaScript, for example, you cannot do string concatenation very easily in Solidity. For example, if you have two string like name plus uh, surname, then you cannot concatenate the two string like this. You also cannot get the length of the string. And there are many other very common operation with strings that we can usually do with other programming language that we just can't do easily in Solidity. So because of all this limitation, in a lot of cases, we actually avoid to use strings in Solidity and instead we use bytes or byte 32. The next gotcha has to do with memory location. In Solidity, when you define a variable, it has a specific memory location. And compared to other programming language, this is actually more complex. For example, if you define an integer here, it will have the storage memory location. And that means that it's going to be stored inside the blockchain. But if you define a variable in a function instead like this, then it's going to have the stack memory location, which means after the function execute, it's going to be destroyed. It's not going to be persisted in the blockchain. And in total, there are four different memory location in Solidity. So if you're not clear on this, check out this video where I explain everything. So the next gotcha has to do with mapping. So mapping in Solidity are a little bit like object in JavaScript, but not, not entirely. So with, so with the mapping, you can associate some keys with some value. And this is widely used in smart contract, but they are not so intuitive to use. For example, it's not possible to instantiate a, a mapping here you cannot do something like mapping of address to integer uh, balances and say okay like i'm gonna do like javascript and i'm gonna have uh, i don't know this address and this value and and this other address and this other value if you do this it's not going to work Instead, you can only reference mapping that have already been declared in the storage memory location. And you're going to assign to a value to them uh, like this. Another weird thing with mapping is that it's not possible to list all the keys. So in JavaScript, you can do object.keys and it's going to give you an array of all the keys of this object, but you cannot do the same thing in Solidity, so you need to track yourself all the different keys. So either uh, it's going to be external user of the smart contract who know the, the keys of your mapping, or you will need to store all these keys in an array yourself. 
And the last thing I find really weird about mapping is that by default, all the keys exist. So that means that if you try to read the value of a keys that hasn't been created yet, like, I don't know, some random address here, for example, this has absolutely a value. And so by default, that's the default value of, of the type that is uh, that it maps to. So in this case, this is going to be uh, zero. So you always be able to access any keys of any mapping. The next gotcha has to do with arrays. So in Solidity, we do have arrays like in JavaScript, but they work a bit differently. So for example, here I can define an array of integer. And in a function, I can manipulate these arrays. For example, here I can add any value to this array. So we have so we say that this is a dynamic size array. I don't need to specify the size and I can add as many entry as I want. But it's also possible to define an array in memory like this. But in this case, I need to specify the size of the array here. This is going to be an array of, of a size of length 10. So it's not possible to have a dynamic size array that is in memory. It's only for storage array. So here, if I try to use the push method, then there's going to be an error. There is no push method for that kind of array. So that's a bit annoying. And that means that every time you declare an array of in memory, you need to know in advance what's going to be the length of the array. The next gotcha has to do with what you can return from external functions. So external functions are functions that can only be called from outside the smart contract. And you can return some data from this function. For example, you can return uh, an integer. So here I can return uh, one. But if I try to return an array of string like this, then this is not possible. And if you want to know the reason, it's because behind the hood, uh, a string is an array itself. So this is an array of array. And it is also not possible to return array of array in solidity. You can do it if you add a experimental pragma statement. So pragma uh, experimental. I don't remember the exact uh, syntax, but basically the, the Solidity compiler will, will tell you exactly what you need to, to, to add. But it's not really recommended to use this pragma statement in production because uh, these features might be removed in future version of Solidity. It's also not possible to return a struct from a, a smart contract. So here, if you define a struct a with a couple of field inside, then yeah, you just can't can do this unless you put the experimental pragma statement. So instead, if you want to return a struct, you need to return a tuple of all its fields. So for example, here we have a single field. So I'm going to return only one integer. But if we had two, uh, then I would return to integer, etc, etc. The next gotcha has to do with the number of variables that you declare in a function. So here, if you have a function and you declare too many variables inside, etc, etc. So if you have many, many, many variables, at some point you will hit the limit of solidity and you will receive the error message stack to dip. And actually this limit is not very high. I think it starts to trigger around uh, 15 or 16 variables. So this can be quite annoying. And uh, when you see this, you have no choice but to find a way to decrease the number of variables. The next gotcha is related to events. So in Solidity, you can emit some data for outside consumer by using events. So first you need to define an event. Then your event will have a couple of fields. It can be integer, uh, it can be string, uh, and any other Solidity type. And after in a function, you can emit this event like this emit my event and you pass it all the string one hey and then outside consumer like uh, the front end of decentralized application can listen to the, these events 
The thing is, once a smart contract has emitted an event, there is absolutely no way for the smart contract to read or modify this event. This is just something that the smart contract create for outside consumer, but the smart contract itself is unable to access this event after it was emitted. The next gotcha has to do with ether transfers. So a smart contract can send or receive some ether. And the way you send ether to a smart contract is by calling one of its function. And that's not super intuitive. So for example, if I want to send some ether to this smart contract, I will need to declare a function and make it payable. If you don't make it payable, it's not possible to call this function and send some ether. The other solution is to use what we call the fallback function. So that's an unnamed function that is called when someone sends ether to this contract, but without mentioning any specific function. In the end, a function will still be executed if it exists. And that's the fallback function. And you also need to make it payable. And lastly, if you try to send some ether to a smart contract without calling any of its function, and this smart contract does not have a fallback function, then your ether transfer will be rejected. The next gotcha has to do with locking some ether or some ERS20 token inside a smart contract. So let's say that you have a smart contract that can receive some ether. So it has a fallback function like this. So you send some ether to the smart contract, but beside this fallback function, you don't have any other function. Well, you know what, my friend, congratulations, because you just locked all the ether in the smart contract, because now there is absolutely no way to spend this ether. If you want to be able to spend this ether, you need to have another function. For example, uh, you make it, you call it send. Uh, and then probably that you'll do some check like you require that the sending address uh, is an administrator that you defined before and here a new, a new argument on your function you're going to define uh, maybe the recipient of the transaction and then the amount and then you're going to send the ether to this address like this and so with this function, then you are safe because now you can send your ether after that was sent to the smart contract. And the same thing also apply to ERC20 tokens. So whenever a smart contract receives some ether or some ERC20 token, make sure to create a function to transfer this asset later. So the next gotcha has to do with manipulating integer variables. So Let's give an example. So let's say that we have an integer variable here and here we accept another integer as an argument. And here I'm going to add A and B. A can represent integer up to a certain value. So that's a very, very, very high value. But if here A is already equal to the maximum value and you keep adding to it, then what's going to happen is an overflow. So because the type cannot represent any number that is bigger than that, it's going to loop back to the beginning of the range. So C is going to equal zero instead of a very, very high number. Underflow is the same mechanism, but it happened on the other side of the range. If you uh, keep decreasing an integer up to the minimum value, then it's going to wrap around and become very, very big. So in particular, if you do some ether transfer and you base your ether transfer on uh, addition or subtraction, that you are vulnerable to overflow or underflow. So to prevent against this, you can use a library that is called safe math. With safe math, every time you want to do some arithmetic, then you use the library instead of using the operator of solidity. The next gotcha is what we call a re-entrancy attack. So let's see how this can happen. So here I have my foo function and this foo function is going to call the function of another smart contract. So smart contract B, I'm going to call, I don't know, a bar. 
it's possible for this other smart contract B to call back inside my foo function. And by doing so, it can, create, it can create some really nasty effect. That's how the infamous hack of the DAO happened in 2016 and how the DAO smart contract lost all of its ether. To prevent against this, you have several solutions. One solution is to limit the amount of gas that is forwarded to the bar function in the called smart contract so that it doesn't have enough gas to call you back. Another defense is to have a locking mechanism and the open zippling framework show you how to do this. The next gotcha is spending too much gas. So when you execute a transaction on a smart contract, you have to spend some ether and that is measured in a unit called gas. By the way, if you have no idea what is gas, check out my series on gas on this channel. So you have to be careful because the more computationally intensive your code is, the more gas you're gonna spend. For example, if you have some full loop, then this can make, potentially can make you spend a lot of gas. Also, if you use some uh, hashing function like Kachak256, this is also very uh, gas intensive. So this is very different from a traditional programming language like JavaScript, where computation are very cheap. In Solidity, computation are very expensive. So we really try to minimize the gas consumption. The next gotcha is that it's not possible to call external APIs from a Solidity smart contract. So here in your foo function, for example, if you want to call the API of Twitter and get all the tweets of a specific user, then it's not possible to do it. What's possible to do though, is to import outside data inside the blockchain and then your smart contract will be able to consume this data. And for that, you use the Oracle pattern. By the way, if you want to receive my five most useful Solidity tips, make sure to register by following the link in the description. That's totally free. That's it for this list of Solidity gotchas. If you have any question or, or if there are any other gotchas that I haven't mentioned, then please let me know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching and see you for another video on Solidity and Ethereum programming. Bye-bye.